very much. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Okay. What I'm talking about tonight is an idea that really began for me about 25 years ago and has pretty much obsessed me ever since. And it began as a musical idea. It began as something I heard in music. And gradually I realized that in fact it was an idea that was occurring in all sorts of areas. And in the course of this talk, what I would like to do is to trace the history of that idea in my own work and in the work of some other people and also to show how the idea suddenly branches out, opens up and becomes a metaphor for what I think is a very important new body of thinking. I have 45 minutes to do this, so, <laughs> and I have a clock here as well. Um, in the mid-60s, something happened in modern music uh, which really made a division between what had happened prior to that and what was now starting to happen. Um, at the time it was called the New Tonalism, I believe, or the New Tonality. And it was a movement away from the classical tradition which had sort of defined progress as becoming more atonal, becoming more chaotic and in a sense becoming less musical in the sense that ordinary people would understand the word music. In the mid-60s, Terry Riley, Steve Reich, Philip Glass and several others began working with tonal music again. Simple chords, simple intervals, rhythms that you could follow that weren't in 15-8 and things like that. Music you could, in fact, almost dance to. Um, at the time, the distinguishing characteristic of that music seemed to be that it was tonal as opposed to atonal. Um, over the course of time since then, I think another important characteristic has emerged. And it, it was very clear in the first major piece of Terry Riley's called In C. Most of you probably know of this piece, or some of you probably know it, and many of you may have played it, actually. It's a very famous piece of music. Um, it consists of 52 bars of um, music written in the key of C, and the instructions to the musicians are proceed through those bars at any speed you choose. So you can begin on bar one, play that for as many times as you want, 20 or 30 times, then move to bar two. If you don't like that much, just play it once, go on to bar three. The important thing is, that each musician moves through at his or her own speed. The effect of that, of course, is to create a very complicated cluster of uh, quite unpredictable combinations. And of course, if this is performed with a lot of musicians, you get a very dense and fascinating web of sound as a result. It's actually a beautiful piece, and I think, um, having listened to it again recently, I, I think it's stood the test of time very well. That piece, however, was not the one which blew my socks off. That um, dubious credit goes to another piece of music by a composer called Steve Reich. Um, it was, I think, his earliest recorded piece. And it's a piece called It's Gonna Rain, and I would like to just listen to a bit of that now. Thank you. 
there for many years, I was the only person I knew who thought that was a beautiful piece of music. Um, it's quite a long piece, it's about 17 minutes long. And it's produced by a very, very simple process. It's a loop of a preacher saying, it's going to rain. And identical copies of the loop are being played on two machines at once. Because of the inconsistency in the speed of the machines, they gradually slip out of sync with one another. They start to sound like an echo, then they sound like a cannon, and gradually they start to sound like all sorts of things. The piece is very, very interesting because it's tremendously simple. It's a piece of music that anybody could have made. But the results, sonically, are very complex. What happens when you listen to that piece is that your listening brain becomes habituated in the same way as your eye does if you stare at something for a very long time. If you stare at something for a very long time, your, your eye very quickly cancels the common information, stops seeing it, and only notices the differences. This is what happens with that piece of music. Quite soon you start hearing very exotic details of the recording itself. For instance, you become aware after several minutes that there are thousands of trumpets in there. This is without drugs. <laughs> With drugs, there would probably be millions. Um, um, but you also become aware that there are birds, actually. There really are birds in there. In, in the original little loop of tape, there are some pigeons or something. And they become very prominent as the thing goes on. But most of all, if you know how the piece is made, what you become aware of is that you're getting a huge amount of material and experience from a very, very simple starting point. Now, this completely intrigued me, partly because I've always been lazy, I guess. So I've, I've always wanted to set things in motion that would produce far more than I had predicted. Um, now, the right piece is really a, it's what would be called visually a moiré pattern. Can I have the overhead projector, please? There we are. So a moiré pattern is when you overlay two identical grids with one another, or so here's one, here's the other. Now when I overlay them, you see what happens? You get very complicated interactions. You get something that actually you wouldn't have predicted from, from these two original identical sheets of paper. So this is actually a very good analog of the Steve Wright piece in action. Um, something happens because of one's perception, um, rather than because of anything physically happening to these two sheets of plastic which produces effects that you simply couldn't have expected or predicted. I was so impressed by this as a way of composing that uh, I made many, many pieces of music using um, more complex variations of that. In fact, all of the stuff that is called ambient music, really, the, sorry, all the stuff I released called ambient music, not not the stuff those other two and a half million people <laughs> released called ambient music. <laughs> all, all of my ambient music, I should say, really is based on that kind of principle, on the idea that um, it's possible to think of a system or a set of rules which, once set in motion, will create music for you. Now, the wonderful thing about that is, of course, that it starts to create music that you've never heard before. This is an important point, I think. It's a move away from the idea of the composer as someone who can complete image and then sets about. This is a different way of composing. It's putting in motion something and letting it make the thing for you. Now, um, one of the first pieces I did like that was um, a piece called Music for Airports. This is, um, thank you very much. <laughs> this is in fact a picture of the alien fleet that abducted me last time I was in San Francisco. <laughs> and that, that's the mothership just there at the bottom. It, it was an awful experience because they stole all my hair. <laughs> no, in fact, this is really a diagram of music for airports. Music for airports at least one of the pieces on there, is structurally very, very simple. There are six sung notes. 
sung by three women and myself. And uh, one of the notes repeats every, I don't know, something like 23 and a half seconds. It's, it was in fact a long loop running around a series of tubular aluminium chairs in Connie Plank's studio. Um, the next lowest loop repeats every 25 and 7 8 seconds or something like that. The third one every 29 and 15 16 seconds or something. So what I mean is they all repeat in cycles that are called incommensurable. They are not likely to come back into sync again. So this is the piece moving along in time. Your experience of the piece, of course, is a moment in time there. So as the piece progresses, what you hear are the various clusterings and configurations of these six basic elements. The basic elements in that particular piece never change. They, they stay the same. But the piece does appear to have quite a lot of variety. Um, in fact, it's about eight minutes long on that record, but I did have a 30-minute version of it, which I also enjoyed listening to. Um, the, the thing about pieces like this, of course, is that they are actually of almost infinite length. If, if the numbers involved are complex enough, they simply don't ever reconfigure in the same way again. Um, so this is, this is music for free, in a sense. The considerations that are important then become questions of how the system works and most important of all, what you feed into the system. What goes into the mincer in the first place. Now, this is something I think that um, the classical composers who came to this way of composing had not thought about very much. They accepted given instruments and invented systems to reconfigure them. To me, that was an important part of it. And I think um, coming from pop music, which of course is a music more than anything else about sound and about the possibilities of sound in studios, um, coming to doing this from that background, I think I was well equipped for that. Um, music for Airports came out in uh, 1978 to howls of neglect. <laughs> um, in fact, it didn't do at all well in England, but it did do quite well here by comparison. Um, so I have an eternal debt to the United States for actually um, cheering me up a little bit when that record came out. In fact, I was so depressed about the response to the record in, and the other stuff I'd been doing in England that I uh, decided to move to America for a few years. <laughs> um, which might be the um, sign of a weak-willed person who lives off flattery, but, you know, <laughs> there you go. Um, one of the first places I came to was San Francisco. I lived here for a while. And, in fact, I practically lived in the Exploratorium. Um, which I have, yes, in fact, I have my, uh, sorry, I have my Exploratorium instant worry in my pocket, you see. <laughs> if you haven't visited the Exploratorium in the last month, you should go. It's really a good place. If every city had one of those, there would place, I think. But in the Exploratorium, the thing that absolutely hooked me, in the same way that the Steve Reich piece had hooked me, was a simple computer demonstration. It was one of the first things I'd ever seen on a computer, actually, of a game invented by an English mathematician called John Conway. And the game was called Life. <laughs> a modest title for a game. Um, Life is a very simple game, unlike uh, the one we're in. Um, and it only actually has a few rules, which I shall now tell you. You divide up an area into squares, so you won't, you won't see the squares on the demonstration I'm going to do of this. And a square can either be dead or alive, so, okay, there's a, there's a live square now. 
Here's another one. There's another one. Let's put another one there. The rules are very simple. In the next generation, that's to say the next click of the clock, the squares are going to change status in some way or another. A square that has one or zero neighbors is going to die. A live square that has one or zero neighbors is going to die. A square with two neighbors is going to survive. A square with three neighbors is going to give birth, is going to come alive if it isn't already alive. A square with four or more neighbors is going to die of overcrowding. Um, now, these are terribly simple rules, and you would think, well, this probably couldn't produce anything very interesting. Um, Conway spent apparently about a year finessing these simple rules. They started out much more complicated than that. He found that those were all the rules you needed to produce something that appeared lifelike. Um, what I have over here, if you can now go to this Mac computer, please. Um, can you go to the Mac, please? Yeah, okay. So, I have a little group of squares up there, of, of live squares. Um, when I hit go, I hope they're going to start behaving according to those rules. Okay, there they go. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. What's interesting about this is that so much happens. The rules are very, very simple. But this little population here will reconfigure itself, form beautiful patterns, collapse, open up again, do all sorts of things. It will have little pieces that wander around, like this one over here. Um, <laughs> little things that never stop blinking, like these ones. Um, what's very interesting is that this is extremely sensitive to the condition in which you start it. If I had drawn it one dot different, it would have a totally different history. So this is, I think, kind of counterintuitive. One's intuition doesn't lead you to believe that something like this would happen. Um, okay, that's now, that's now settled. That will never change, I think, from that. Um, it's settled to a fixed condition. I'll just show you another one. Um, Okay. Um, in fact, I'll show you this one in color because it looks nice. Right. Um, just a little treat. <laughs> um, at the Exploratorium, I, I spent literally weeks playing with this thing, um, which just goes to show how idle you can be if you're unemployed. <laughs> but I was so fascinated, I wanted to train my intuition to grasp this. Do you see what I mean? I wanted, to, I wanted this to become intuitive to me. I wanted to be able to understand this message that I'd found in the Steve Reich piece, in the Riley pieces, in, in my own work, and now in this. But very, very simple rules clustering together can produce very complex and actually rather beautiful results. Um, I wanted to do that because I felt that this was the most important new idea of the time. Since then, I've become more convinced of that, and actually I hope I can convince you of that tonight. Life was the first thing I ever saw on a computer that interested me, actually, and uh, almost the last, actually, as well. Um, <laughs> For many, many years, I didn't see anything else. I saw all sorts of work being done on computers that I, I thought was basically a reiteration of things that had been better done in other ways, um, or that were pointlessly elaborate. I didn't see many things that had this, this degree of class to them, of very simple beginnings with very complex endings. I didn't until, uh, no, this is a bit of a, bit of a segue here while I try to get the next part working. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do in order to finesse this. I'm, I'm going to play, at the same time as I was working with life, I was also starting to do some new pieces of music. 
that use the Moiré principle, but in a much more sophisticated way. So now I have to go back to the back to the overhead, please. Hello. Back to the overhead, please. This is me at the overhead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, How's it going so far then? <laughs> I thought he was going to bring a synthesizer. <laughs> what I started to do was to make moires of different types of elements. Um, not only of single notes or similar sounds, but moires of basically rules about how sounds were made. And this gave me some very much more interesting results, as you can see. Here are, there's two simple cycles going out of phase, and here's a wiggly one going out of phase with them. Um, and then, hallelujah, new age music. which I am consistently being blamed. <laughs> um, there we are, there's another one. Okay, well, you get the idea that, in fact, you can, um, you can start to build very beautifully complex webs of things from very simple initial ingredients. And I, what I would like to do is play you a piece called Narrowly, which was released... Um, I don't know, five years ago or something, which is a another version of this way of working. Um, I've only ever had one idea, really, and that was this. So, so everything I'm going to play is kind of a version of this idea. Can you put on narrowly, please? And I'll leave this running, because it's a very good piece of music to talk over. Um, and meantime, well, let's play. Are you putting on narrowly? Thank you. Meantime, I'll go to this. <laughs> That one there. Um, can you now put on this Mac, please? Okay. The next thing I ever saw on a computer that really astonished me was a screensaver by a local lad called Gene Tantra. Um, I don't know if he's here tonight. I really wanted to invite him, but um, I didn't have his number. So. Um, he made a screensaver for the aptly named BIM company After Dark. Um, and this screensaver, which they only released in one of their files because it was clearly much too good to come out very often, was, was called Stained Glass. Stained Glass, unlike almost all other screensavers, looks at its own history. Stained Glass generates images, then it sucks them out, multiplies them, chops them about, collages them together in different ways. Um, I realized that if you put other screensavers in the center of stained glass, then it would do the same thing to them. It's a, a visual generative piece. Um, I've got three versions of stained glass. There's one along the top there. This square is another, and then this oblong is, is a third. And at the center of these two is a different screensaver called Doodles. Now, Someone in a London magazine, when I said I'd spent a long time looking at screensavers, described this as rather sad. <laughs> With that infallible cynicism that we English are so good at. But the reason I was looking at them so closely was because, again, they picked up that thread of something that uses a tiny amount of information a minute amount of your computer's processing power and produces something that for me is 30 times as beautiful as anything I've seen off 
a huge clunky CD-ROM. Now, I quickly realized that this was, the, for me, the future for computers. Computers seen not as ways of crunching huge quantities of data or of storing enormous ready-made forests of material, but computers as a way of growing little seeds. So this piece here, this um, stained glass that's at the basis of this, is a very small seed. In fact, um, I think it's something like 25K. Now, those of you who know what a K is will know that 25 of them isn't very many. Um, <laughs> this uh, the kind of precise scientific language you can expect this evening. <laughs> Um, just to give you an impression, uh, a CD-ROM is um, ooh, very much bigger than that. <laughs> um, I've never actually worked this out. It's something like 30,000 times more information in the CD-ROM, I suppose, than is needed to make this work. But I think this is about 30,000 times as interesting, actually, partly because it never repeats itself. This thing will go on generating like this, and it will stay pretty much the same, but it will never be identical. Well, this suits me fine. I don't want big surprises, but I want a certain level of surprise, you know. Um, I'm too old for big surprises now, after those aliens. Um, so on and on it goes, and I thought, this has got to be the future of computer music. I'd seen so many things done on computers that were hopelessly overwrought and complicated and in the end sounded like what I call bubble and squeak music. Or on the other hand, sounded like typical sequence of music, you know, sequence of music where everything is bolted together and it's all completely rigidly locked. It would have been great in the 1930s, I'm sure. That music. Um, and I wanted something that actually had, a, had an organic quality to it, had some sense of movement and change, and every time you played it, something slightly different happened. So, screensavers. In fact, Gene Tantra's screensaver, I have to say, was the first thing that I saw like that. Um, subsequently, I saw another one by another local lad called Greg Jalbert, which is called Bliss, which is another very, very interesting system. Both of those things um, really impressed me, mostly because they were economical, and I, I am so thrilled by anything economical. It's so easy not to be economical, and anything that uses a very small amount of information smartly impresses me. Um, I came to California a couple of years ago um, with the idea that the right approach to using this new medium called CD-ROM was to actually use it not as a way of, as I said, storing forests, which you then tediously navigate through. You know, it takes you four minutes to see another button on the Prince video. You know. <laughs> but uh, I thought how, how much more exciting it would be to see something that happened like that immediately, and furthermore, happened in a way that you'd never seen it happen before. And it seemed to me that this was the answer, to somehow use the CD-ROM as a way of planting seeds and then using to grow those seeds for you. Um, in fact, though, although this is abstract, Ty Roberts from ION proved to me that this could also be done figuratively. It doesn't have to be abstract. I don't have an example of that, but in an afternoon, Ty managed to put together a, an animation of a figure, which was a generative animation. That's to say, it didn't rely on calling up a stored video. It relied on having a very small seed and then performing certain operations. They were actually um, twists and turns from Photoshop performed live onto this um, seed. So, in a sense, the theory was vindicated but only in a sense, because um, it never got made in that way. Um, I went back to England 
not really having seen the musical thing I'd hoped to find, I, I had come with a whole proposal for how to make a, a sort of generative music system in a computer. It was a kind of a muddled proposal because I don't know enough about computers to, to frame it properly. Um, but it was fairly detailed and fairly accurate to what has since happened. When I got back to England, uh, about a year afterwards, a letter came through from some people called Sayer, a company called Sayer, located in exotic, sunless Beaconsfield, which is about 25 miles north of London. So I, I had been imagining that I would find the answer in, in uh, San Francisco, but in fact, these guys were working just up the M1, actually. Um, they sent me a demo of something they had done, and it was a, a music generating system. I listened to this um, CD, and there were a couple of pieces on it that were sort of clearly in my style. Um, in fact, it turned out that they were followers of my music indeed. The, the interesting thing to me was that the pieces that were in my style were actually very good examples of my style. In fact, they were rather better than any I had recently done. <laughs> um, so I, I was rather impressed by this. I got in touch with them and the next example is really in a way the center of this talk, which is lucky because I'm about halfway through on the clock. Um, this is a program, now I need the PC, please. It's only available on PC, I'm sorry to say. Um, yes, I thoroughly agree. The people from SEO are here tonight. Hit louder. <laughs> we have one supporter of the PC system in the front row here. He's wearing a white T-shirt. <laughs> Um, this is a very, very interesting system. It allows you to specify a set of instruments. I should first of all tell you a little bit about it technically. This is a computer. <laughs> In there, there's a sound card. That's to say, a little synthesizer. And this computer tells that little synthesizer what to play according to the rules that I've set in here. Now, these rules cover all sorts of things that you might want to do musically. They cover very obvious things like what scale is the piece in. And just to show you what that looks like. Um, okay, let's go up here. Oops, I'm sorry. This is uh, slightly reconfigured since, since I last looked at it. Oh, here we are. Okay, these are scales. Now, if I want to have a little bit of minor second in my scale, I can do that. Let's have no major second, let's have a bit of this, a bit of that, and a little bit of that, and some of that, and some more of that, and so on and so on. So, I show you that to indicate that all of the rules are probabilistic. That's to say, they are rules that define a kind of envelope of possibilities. So, the, the machine is going to improvise within a set of rules, which is to say that there's a greater chance that it's going to play a fifth than a flat fifth, for example so on and so on. Um, there are rules concerning harmony. Um, that's to say, and a second harmony, in play a flat fifth harmony, but all these others are permitted. Um, there are rules con concerning how it will move from note to note. Will it move in big steps or small steps? And in fact, in this piece here, I have some of the instruments are going to move by big steps and some by quite small steps. Um, there are 150 of these kinds of rules. They govern major considerations like uh, the basic quality of the piece to quite minor ones like um, exactly how the note wobbles. So I'll play you a bit. Is this thing up? He cried to the empty void. <laughs> Okay, so this piece of music, which 
is quite unpredictable and it sometimes has quite large gaps in it, as it has shown to be right now. Just, just to embarrass you. This, this music is making itself now. It, it, it is not a recording. Thanks a lot. Um, and I have never heard it play exactly this before. If you don't believe me, I'll start it again. See? Um, it will start. Okay, there we are. Um, this piece, I guess I've listened to for maybe a couple of hundred hours or so. I often have it running in my studio while I'm making records. And it's it's a, a very satisfying piece of music. It carries on rebuilding itself. It sometimes pulls a surprise, like there's, there's one very exotic harmony that can only occur under particular conditions. Occasionally it pulls it out. Um, what's interesting to me is that, again, it's very economical. You can use a computer in many other ways while you're doing this. You know, if you want to use it as a word processor, carry on. It'll carry on making the music in the background. I'll play you a part of another piece just to show that it no. just to show that it can do other things. Um, yeah, they're so unpredictable. They're very difficult to display to people because you sort of switch them on and say, "Listen to this," and nothing happens. Um, I'll just, if you just turn that down, I'll leave this running um, while I talk. Um, having started working with this system, I am so thrilled by it. I mean, I think there are other generative music systems, but I happen to understand this one, and I know it's a good one. I'm so thrilled by it that it's very difficult for me to listen to records anymore. Because putting on a record and knowing I'm going to hear the same thing I did last time has actually become a little bit irksome. It feels sort of quite Victorian now to do that. Um, and, and I think this has really moved us into a new phase of music. You know, up until about a hundred years ago, people never heard the same music twice. Of course, it was always different. When recording appeared, suddenly you had the wonderful luxury of being able to play music wherever you wanted to and control it in various ways. But of course, it was always the same thing. Now you have this thing, which is a kind of a new hybrid, where you can play the music wherever you want, just like a record, but it won't be the same thing each time. This is actually very thrilling, I think. Um, now, whether you like the music or not is another issue. This just happens to be the music I make. It doesn't have to sound like this, just to console you. Um, but it's very good for making techno and all that sort of thing as well. Um, I was informed on the radio the other day that I was the father of industrial music, um, which is not something I've been accused of before, I must say. So now we get to, uh, oh yes, I better have the overhead projector back, please. I started thinking about the, oops, tell no, wide. Yeah, okay. I started thinking about the differences between generative and what I would call classical or symphonic music. I'm, I haven't really decided on a name for the rest of it. Um, and, and these, I think, are the differences. Now, what I want you to imagine is that it's not music can be anywhere along a line between these two. Um, classical music, like classical architecture and like many other classical forms, specifies an entity in advance and then builds it. Generative music doesn't do that. It specifies a set of rules and then lets them make the thing. In the uh, words of Kevin Kelly's great book, generative music is out of control, classical music is under control. Now, out of control means you don't know quite what it's going to do. Um, it has its own life. Um, generative music is unpredictable, classical music is predicted, unrepeatable, repeatable.
generative music is unfinished. That's to say, when you use generative, you implicitly don't know what the end of this is. Okay. This is idea in architecture as well, the book called How Buildings Learn. One of the messages I got from was the idea of move of architecture away from the job of making finished monumental entities towards the job of making things that would then be finished by the users, constantly refinished, in fact, by the users. This is a more humble and much more interesting job for the architect, I think. Um, generative music is sensitive to circumstances. That's to say it will react differently depending on its initial conditions, on where it's happening, and so on. Whereas classical music seeks to subdue them. By that I mean that classical music seeks a neutral battleground, you know, the, the flat field. It wants a concert hall with a fixed reverberation with not too many emergencies and people who don't cough during the music, basically. Um, generative forms, in general, are multi-centered. There's not a simple chain of command which runs from the top of the pyramid to the rank and file below. There are many, many, many um, web-like modes which become more or less active you might notice the resemblance here to the difference between broadcasting and the internet, for example. I'll jump down to here. Diffuse authorship, that's to say, you never know who made it. You know, with this generative music that I played you, am I the composer? Are you, if you buy the system, the composer? Is Tim Coles and his brother who wrote the software the composer? Who actually composes music like this? Can you describe it as composition exactly when uh, you don't know what it's going to be? Um, as an image, symphonies and wind chimes are the two things to think about. Um, generative music is a bit more complicated than symphony than uh, wind chimes. Classical a bit more complicated than symphonies. I'm rushing a bit now because I only have seven minutes left. Um, I thought this wouldn't happen. Now. Why does an idea like this grab my attention so much? I said at the beginning that what I thought was important about this idea was that it keeps opening out. This, this notion of self-generating systems, of organisms, keeps becoming a richer and richer idea for me. I see it happening in more and more places. Um, some of you Kevin's book out of many senses about this idea in all sorts of other areas by um, Stuart Kaufman which is, is a very, very in, sort of inspiring and upture where we relatively because I think that artists do and what people who make culture do is somehow produce simulators where new ideas like this can be explored. If you start to accept the idea of generative music. If you take home one of my not available in the foyer packs and play it at home, and you know that this is how this thing is made, you start to change your concepts about how things can be organized. What you've done is moved into a new kind of metaphor, how things are made and, and how they evolve, really, how they look after themselves. Now, evolving metaphors, in my opinion, is, is what artists do. They produce works that give you the chance to experience in a safe environment, because nothing really happens to you when you're looking at artworks. They give you the chance to experience what might be quite dangerous and radical new ideas. They give you the chance to step out of real life into simulator life. Um, a metaphor is a way of explaining something that we've experienced in a set of terms, a different set of terms. Um, how long have I got? Sorry, I must know because I want to know how far off I can go. <laughs> Five minutes? Okay. Well, uh, no, I can't listen to you. <laughs> oh, no, no. Um, okay, I'll, I'll get into metaphors. We're, um, okay. Um, there we are. Are we on this? Yeah. There's a very interesting book by 
Lakoff and Johnson, that famous 30s singing team. Um, it's a book about metaphors. It's called Metaphors We Live By. And they give a very clear example of the effect of metaphors. They say, um, we're used in our culture to the metaphor that argument is war. So all of our, all of our language about arguments, she defeated him, he attacked her position, so on and so on. They're, they're all arguments that relate to fighting. When we think about the process of arguing, we tend to then reconstruct our possibilities in terms of that metaphor. What Lakoff and Johnson say was, suppose that somebody had said, argument is dance. Suppose that was the dominant metaphor, so that instead of it being seen as a process where one person defeats another, it becomes seen as a process where two people together make something beautiful between them. We could have that metaphor for arguments, we don't. But do you understand how a shift of that kind produces an entirely different kind of discourse? How the shift from one way of viewing an activity that we will engage in to another changes that activity. Suddenly our, our language of possibilities is renewed and different. What I'm saying, I suppose, when I talk about this, these things here, I'm saying that we are saddled with a whole set of metaphors that belong over here. Those are our metaphors about how the world works, how things organize themselves, how things are controlled, what possibilities there are. My feeling is that generative art in general is a way of not throwing those out. We don't, we don't get rid of old metaphors. We expand them to include more. These things still have value, but we want to include these things as well. Um, I think I have another sheet of paper that says something like that. Oh, I've said that, haven't I? Yeah. Um, so, my feeling about artists is that we are metaphor explorers of some kind. And I, I would like, if I could, to invite you, when you're looking at Spike and Laurie and Dennis, to try to think for a little while in that frame of what metaphors are they looking at, which ones are they renewing, uh, I've got cramp in my toe, sorry. These fashionable shoes. And maybe you'll think about this as you do. Um, an object of culture does all of the following. It innovates, it recycles, it clearly and explicitly rejects, and it ignores. So any artist's work is doing all of those four things and it's doing all of those things to the metaphors that, that uh, dominate our thinking. I have to finish now, so, but I'll be back later. So thank you very much for your attention.